So you all have to forgive me today. I'm fighting one of those uh, two-week coughs. You know, you just continually go through that process. So hopefully, uh, <clears throat> hopefully I'm able to keep my voice for the whole time. Um, <clears throat> so I'm really glad that uh, Dr. Hamilton went through the discussion that he did on this because, uh, um, you know, although we're dealing with uh, kind of a different system, uh, we, you know, we're using a lot of the technologies that he talked about there. And so um, it's, uh, you know, it's been a really interesting process, kind of going back and looking and say, okay, what are limiting factors? What are the, what are the problems here? Because as you, as you go through and you look at uh, where anaerobic digestion is implemented and what substrates it's implemented with, you see that dry lot wastes are typically a problem. Um, they're, they're uh, you know, companies have struggled um, and, you know, there are very few implementations using these dry lot wastes. And so we at uh, Colorado State University kind of started looking at it saying, what can we do? What can we do to address this problem? And so um, this, is a, uh, this is a photo from uh, one of our many uh, dry lot feedlots outside uh, of, you know, the front range of Colorado. And this is about uh, 45 feet in the air on top of a pile that trucks drive around to get to the top. And so many of you have seen areas like this, but uh, very, very large piles of this very dry manure. And so what we're, what we're interested in doing is saying, how can we treat this waste? How can we make this a resource? How can we recover nutrients? And how can we uh, be able to you know, do, uh, uh, you know, process this and be able to have a, a system that will be able to treat it. And uh, this is just a, <clears throat> a picture of some of our uh, animal feeding operations. We're located up here in uh, Fort Collins. And you can see all across the front range, there's, uh, there's a lot of confined animal feeding operations. And so uh, we started looking and saying, how can, we, how can we handle the very large amount of waste that we see in these dry <coughs> lots? This is just a, a photo of uh, one of those uh, such systems. Currently they are uh, you know, composting wa the waste in uh, windrows, but um, you know, material as it's collected from the, from actually from this, I believe we collected it from this lot uh, um, two summers ago, and we, we collected waste that was 94% total solids. I mean, like a, an oven at 100 degrees Celsius dried at just 5%. It's, it's incredible the kind of um, conditions that we can get here. And so the idea of taking that and diluting it to 10% solids for a completely stirred tank reactor, you know, that, that's, that's a challenge, not only because that's a lot of water in an arid climate, but also because that's a big tank. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're interested in saying, okay, well, how do, we, how do we design around this? And so as we started looking at it, some of these wastes, uh, you know, they have a decent biochemical methane potential, um, but, you know, as we, as we look at it, the total solids are, are very high. And so as we go back to, you know, some existing technologies, again, I kind of echo Dr. Hamilton, you know, this isn't, this isn't all of the systems, but, you know, these are some things that are, that are often used. One component to notice is that, wow, uh, you know, the total solids here is really low. Uh, we're dealing with, uh, you know, total solids under 15, uh, some you know, plug flow systems run higher than that, but regardless, we're dealing with something where there's a lot of dilution that's needed. And so, um, one, you ask the uh, producers to change their management practices, which uh, not, is, is, a, is a tough idea in the first place, but um, also you know, just the logistics of doing that, it, it's not feasible. And that's why these facilities are located in our area of the world, is because it's arid. And so, how do we accommodate that? And so, um, as, we, as we started looking at this, and um, we, we just kind of broke it down. And we said, okay, well, we have you know, multiple biological processes. We have hydrolysis process first that takes these complex carbohydrates or proteins and breaks them down into the monomers. Um, <clears throat> we have the acetogenic and acidogenic processes where we're taking and uh, you know, converting those you know, soluble products that are produced in the hydrolysis step into things that the methogenic bacteria can use. And then lastly, there's the methogenic bacteria, which then take those products and make methane out of it. And so as we started kind of dissecting it and looking at it and trying to understand what are the limiting factors, everything from you know, the, um, the problems with, with having enough of the methogenic bacteria, which sometimes can 
you know, have doubling rates two, three days. And so they grow very slowly. So how can we do that? And so we, we decided that we wanted a high rate system for our methogenic reactor. We wanted something that worked. Uh, and the fixed film reactor is great, but if you uh, remember from Dr. Hamilton's slides or uh, a couple slides further up, we're, we're dealing with very low solids. And so the idea is, is that if we take and we can extract those soluble products, we can take those soluble products directly out of the material that we're dealing with and then take those and process those with a high rate reactor, it's kind of a win-win. We keep the solids where they're supposed to be. We're, we're not dealing with sand accumulation. We're not dealing with, you know, all of the, you know, maybe floating matter that comes to the top. All of that stays inside one reactor. And the process that we chose for that was a leachate bay or a leachate bed uh, reactor. And with that process, we take and we pass leachate that we've collected and, and recycled onto the top of the waste material. It then filters through, collects the materials uh, that are solubilized through the hydrolysis process, and then lastly, um, we take those and, and pass those into the rest of the system. But there's a few other things that we can do here. Because we're kind of splitting these things apart, we, we really can say, all right, let's take and put the solids, the things that have structure, you know, food waste, uh, these manures that are dried, you know, let's put them in here because we can pass water through those. And, and we've developed processes for dealing with waste such as um, feedlot manure that often turn into a slurry. We have processes for taking that and passing water through it. Um, but then, what about the slurries? What about the swine waste? Um, we can put those directly into the compositing tank. And what we've done with uh, slurries in the past is we've configured that compositing tank to be a UASB. Now, um, the thing with the UASB is, is we're not necessarily using the full capacity of the methogenic bacteria. It's operating in some ways as a sacrificial system because many of you know that um, anaerobic digesters are very prone to um, acidic conditions. You put too much waste in, too much is hydrolyzed and turned into acid, and you have a problem. Well, because we have a very solid and separated fixed film reactor, we're able to separately optimize that, and we're able to allow it to uh, operate at the pH that it needs to work at, and use this compositing tank in some ways as a sacrificial reactor. And so, um, so we can put the slurries into there, and then lastly, if we have a, um, a material or a substrate that is readily biodegradable, then we can put it directly into the fixed film reactor. And so it's kind of a, you know, depending on what phase it's in, we can take and pass that into the system as needed. And so that's one of the inherent advantages of our system. Real quick, uh, we've got our leachate bays here. And uh, um, they take and go into leachate storage with the compositing tank. And we would take maybe bay one, for example, and fill it up on day one and, um, and cycle them through here in a sequencing batch type arrangement. You fill it up with the waste. And then um, if you, let's say we have a 28 day retention time, we have operated it uh, lower than that, but if it's 28 days, it'd be a week in each, uh, each week you would change out one of those bays. And so uh, what you're doing is your, your hydrolysis products are coming out and if you overlay the, um, the production from each one of those leachate bays, you're able to get a fairly consistent uh, loading um, into the leachate storage tank and then you can meter that in as needed into the fixed film digester. Uh, one, one side point here is that if, uh, you know, many of you are dealing with, uh, producers may have on-farm digesters, and, and some of them are producing during the peak hours of the day, producing just during the peak hours of the day. With, with our process, we're actually able to store the leachate in its, uh, in its, um, in, in its chemical form before it's turned into a gas, and then release the gas as needed uh, by passing it into the fixed film reactor. It takes about three hours to reach full production within the fixed film. So it reduces gas storage requirements. So yeah, uh, for, for our arid climate, we're, we're dealing with reduced water requirements. Uh, we have inherent substrate flexibility. Uh, we can take waste as needed um, from a variety of sources. Uh, crop residues during certain times of the year and so on and so forth can be stored and uh, processed uh, as needed. Um, and uh, we also have the potential for reduced capital costs, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But um, 
the big thing is that we, we have the ability to do some really good uh, control here. Because we're separately optimizing these different environments for this microbial ecology, we're able to allow those bacteria to grow in the best circumstances. So we're, we're kind of pairing what we're working on in, the, in this process with, uh, uh, with laboratory studies to help us understand what are the best environments for the specific groups of bacteria, in particular the hydrolysis bacteria. And uh, um, the big thing for anaerobic digestion is that process upset is, is relatively easy to correct because we have uh, excellent control. So um, this, is, uh, this is just a quick graph of our, our biogas production. Biogas uh, for this was approximately uh, 60 to 70 percent methane. And it depends on uh, how large our methogenic reactor is and how long we keep the material in there. But um, significant, uh, significant production there. Um, so this is where we're at right now. We, we've been working on the, uh, the lab scale for, for a good number of years now. We now have an operational uh, pilot unit that has an integrated research facility at the back of it where we are able to take and process side streams <coughs> off of the system in actual laboratory conditions. Uh, and uh, this, is a, this is an image of uh, our kind of loading area. We can take and um, use the funnel at the top of the system to be able to load waste in. This is our uh, LBR, and that LBR, uh, you know, waste goes in, we trickle and pass the water through, and then it goes into the rest of our process. So um, we have a lot of controls here. We have a lot of uh, things going on, um, around 150 control points. We're trying to really understand what's going on in the system. We have uh, integrated uh, um, measurement, uh, online measurement of uh, total organic carbon of, this, of the process, and we're working on online monitoring of uh, a BCMP in, uh, in small BCMP-based sensors. And so uh, we, we're in the process of starting this, and we're the, the next project that we're working on, and we'll be constructing this this summer, this is a funded project to build our at-scale LBR modules. And so one of the inherent parts about our process is that it's, it's really scalable. Uh, you can take and load the waste up. This would be for the dried waste. Uh, you load the dried waste into here in the feedlots or, you know, potentially um, in a city at, uh, you know, if you have, uh, you know, separated municipal solid waste uh, for co-digestion. And uh, those wastes can be loaded in here and then we can uh, process it. And so I'll give you a quick uh, picture of what something like this could look like. What we could take, load the waste into this bay, process it by adding the water through it, and then taking, uh, well, I, I guess, um, taking and processing it here. And then lastly, uh, going through an aerobic process to reduce the odor, as well as uh, uh, in, in some ways be composting or stabilizing the waste. Uh, and that leachate can take and pass through the leachate storage tank, through the high rate reactor, and uh, produces a lot of products for us. And so first of all, we, we have this um, dried uh, compost or fertilizer product, depending on how we process it. Uh, we um, are going to burn the gas. And then uh, potentially, we're, we're looking at ways to monetize this leachate and find ways to, to use that as a, uh, a valuable f fertilizer. And so we're, um, we're currently uh, shopping that idea around in conjunction with our soil and crop style science department at CSU. So um, this is kind of a, a quick look at what something like this could look like. These are the bays uh, that are, are loaded in here um, for, the, for a commercial scale system. Uh, potentially hundreds of these uh, these bays that are collected at the various locations and then brought to our treatment facility. Um, this is um, just a quick look at some software that we uh, um, have worked on developing, and uh, what what it enables us to do is say, okay, for as we look at the idea of using a uh, a regional digestion system, what can we do? And so a future vision is regional digestion because of our ability to treat a variety of waste products. Uh, we're, we're interested in, in looking at how we can combine these different substrates together to be able to process uh, different waste products. And so um, this is just a, a list of the, a few of the people that have uh, supported our research. Uh, and uh, I guess if there's uh, time for questions, I can answer them. 
Okay, so I, I guess I have a question. Um, as you plan to, you said an increased operation requirements, have you seen that there's enough kind of additional gas production from that increased operation to offset some of the, the cost that might be associated? Yeah, so you mean specifically in regard to having separate systems or separate, uh, yeah, separate phases of the process. Um, yeah, so we're, we're currently in the process of doing that. I think the big advantage here is really on the, uh, on the methogenic side, um, specifically with the process, because the ability to separate the methogenic process out and have a, um, a you know, a microbial ecology that is highly optimized for taking those products, that's really good. Um, but it's, it's specifically, um, you know, that's, I think, our biggest rate limitation that we're able to overcome there. But uh, specifically, we're able to treat these, uh, these very dry wastes uh, in a way that, um, that typically is not done um, because of our, our process. And so really it's the, uh, it allows us to be able to treat the, the manure wastes and we have the side benefit of being able to run the methogenic system. So, so you have even seen increased production as compared to other dry digestion systems? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any cool. other questions? So your question is about the logistics of taking all of the waste to one location and then uh, presumably disposing of it in an economical fashion? Yeah, so real quick, um, that software that I showed actually has the capacity of calculating the, the value. We can go take samples from each one of those locations and then plug it in and it can, it can take and actually calculate the cost uh, and the value of that after, it's, after those logistical components are taken out. And so if... Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, we can take and say, okay, yes, um, you know, there is this farm that's 25 miles away, uh, but, you know, even though it's a high, high value material that we can collect, it's not going to make sense. And one other piece about it is that we're really dealing with a lot of dried wastes. And dried wastes have a higher amount of, uh, um, you know, methane production because it doesn't have as much, uh, as much water in it. And so, you know, we're able to transport those wastes a little bit longer than you would be able to do with other wastes. The other critical piece here, and I, I skimmed right over it, is that we need to find a market uh, for that, for the material that comes out. And so that's, I would say, um, you know, we actually are in the process of starting a company out of this. The name is uh, Nexus Bio Energy, but um, it really should be Nexus Bio Products because uh, in the area of, you know, most of those farms are in Weld County. Weld County is one of the highest producers of, uh, of natural gas right now. And so there's a lot of natural gas, there's a lot of it, and we're producing a product that is very low value, and so um, because of that, and so um, we really are emphasizing a lot more on the products that are produced, the bioproducts that are being produced, and so that's where the uh, economics of getting that material off-site and finding a, a high-value uh, uh, market for it—that's where that comes in. So, okay, thank you very much for your time. Great